Okay, folks. Hope y'all are having a good day here. Um, it's time for Rightstream University week number two, and today we're going to be focusing on uh, actually planning our book out, and I'm going to show you a couple ways to do that. Um, the goals for today are really to have a firm grasp on what story you're going to be writing when you go into the drafting phase. The planning phase, so there's four phases if you weren't here last week. It's the um, planning phase, the drafting phase, the uh, editing or revision phase, and then finally the publication uh, publication phase. And I'm going to be taking you through all of those, including actually getting your book out into whatever space you want to, either as an ebook. Uh, and I'm also hopefully going to show everybody how to create a paperback. Uh, all you really need to create a paperback is whatever image software you want to use. You can use um, Inkscape, which is free, and Microsoft Word. So I'll be showing how to format in Microsoft Word. My paperbacks are all formatted in Microsoft Word 2010. It's uh, a 10-year-old version at this point, really, of, of Microsoft Word, but it is plenty powerful to do the interior formatting as long as you have available to you um, a program that will allow you to create PDFs, and there's several free options for that. I use the actual Adobe Acrobat because I tend to use premium kind of fonts. There's certain kinds of fonts that won't that won't embed properly unless you're using uh, the actual paid software. But uh, we'll get to that when we get to it. Today is about planning. Um, you want to have a firm idea of what kind of story you want to write, and I'm going to guide you through all the steps that you need to have to think about all the things lined up. So when you start drafting. You're never clueless about what you're doing. Um, most, in fact, every person I've met who's had writer's block, uh, writer's block is when you're writing a story in the drafting phase and you don't know what comes next. And usually you don't know what comes next because you didn't plan the book out. Now, some people are really good at, at what, what's called pants writing or writing from the seat of your pants or gardening, which is just sitting down and writing and writing without having all of this planning stuff happen ahead of time. But uh, for the most part, if you are planning, whatever you're planning is going to help you, even if you prefer to do a lot of uh, kind of by the seat of your pants writing. And I, I tend to kind of blend the two, but I'll be showing a much more plotted approach, a much more structured approach to planning um, planning your document. And since we're only writing a twenty to 30,000 word document, there's less planning that we have to do compared to say a 100,000 word document. So it should be pretty easy to get a grasp on the concepts that I wanna talk about today. Um, let me take a quick look at the chat and then I'll talk about some questions I got over the, the past week and then we will um, we will dig into it. So uh, hope, hope yourself the family as well. Yeah, family's important. Family's doing okay right now. Um, let's see here. Uh, you saw Lawrence of Arabia on the big screen. Yeah, that's a great movie. Um, I haven't seen it in a long time, but it's a it's a good one. How important are prose to my story? My draft is humming along so far. All I've needed is dialogue. So the prose is important. Um, would a story with just dialogue be a bad idea? Yes. Um, so it is a general a bad idea. And the re it depends what you want to do, right? So James Joyce wrote like a chapter of Ulysses with like no prose. No one, no one in the modern market actually wants to read that. There's a reason why Ulysses, no one reads it. It's because it's impossible to read. It's stupid um, when, it, when it comes to ch the changing styles and things like that. But yeah, you're going to need prose. Dialogue is really important, so start with dialogue. Uh, if you're just writing dialogue, you're writing a screenplay, not really a book. And the point is to get this in the hands of readers who are going to read it. So that means knowing how to describe the action in a prose format, and that's usually going to mean... Um, third person perspective or first person perspective. I went into the room, I saw this, or Michael walked into the room and he saw this. And there's a couple different variations of third person. There's you know, an omniscient, which is where you can get in the heads and describe the thoughts of all the characters. Um, there's which there's another one called neutral, which, which I call neutral anyways, which is no, you don't have any thoughts. Uh, you're merely describing dryly what's happening and and the dialogue is all that you're going to get from uh, introspection into people that's more that's closer to how i write uh, but i tend to write mine a little bit more personal meaning uh if characters leave the room it stays on the main character right um so we'll talk about that when we get to drafting 
and editing, so making sure that your style is consistent. If you have a good idea of what you want to do with style before you begin drafting, that's a really, really good idea. And that's part of the meta planning is deciding, are you going to write this in first person or are you going to write it in third person? Um, there's a couple of odd styles that I would just recommend against in general. One of them is writing in the present tense. Now, there has been some very big bestsellers that have been written in the present tense. She walks in, she does this, he does this, he does that. Fifty Shades of Grey. And then I, th I, th I think, um, what is it? Hunger Games. Hunger Games is written in a slightly different variation of that. It's like present tense, third, like first person. Present tense in general, you, you want to avoid. It feels awkward. And you have to think about what most people like and what most people are familiar with. Um, the novel is a medium. You don't want to reinvent the medium unless there's some specific reason to do it in your story. And for most people, that's not the case. You want to stick with the styles that people are familiar with so they can access the story. The story is more important than some stylistic consideration, which means you should go with what the standard style is. And it's just like if you're painting a painting and you want people to really appreciate it and enjoy the imagery, you want to use those painting techniques which actually produce the image that you're trying to create rather than saying, well, you know, I really want to paint a classic high fantasy painting, but I'm going to do it all in, di in like dog poop. Right? Like, there's no reason to do that unless dog poop means something in the context of the painting. You want to stick with paint, not dog poop. Um, and one of the things that tends to happen in modern and postmodern um, art and literary circles is you you start to, instead of painting a painting, you're painting a paint. Instead of painting a painting of an image, you're painting a painting of a painting. A painting is a medium where everything is about how you access the medium and nothing's about the story. Um, so you really want to focus on the story, not on um, doing anything stylistically weird. So you got to stick with kind of what people are used to and what they like. Um, let's see your hard work. I came up with a story for this writing course. The first and second act are planned out, but I'm having trouble with the ending. The ending should be the, the resolution of your conflict. You have, should have an idea of what the conflict is. And I'll give you a couple examples when we dig into that today. So hopefully you have a better idea of how to end it by the end of today, and then you can start drafting. Thoughts on Catcher in the Rye? I haven't read it in years. Um, I will say about Catcher in the Rye is that it's a book that's very different from how it's taught in school, like many books. So Catcher in the Rye is really about what I what I would call a sexually frustrated gamma male, uh, and uh, he objectifies women and uh, views basically views all things as centered around sexual access. But no, I've never seen a teacher ever analyze it that way. They just don't seem to pick up on that, on what Salinger was doing there. It's really, it's it's a good book if I remember it, but last time I took any kind of look at it was like substituting for an English teacher that was away. And I'm like, I'm like, they're doing like a close reading of it, which is something kind of a modern thing. You like close reading. I'm like, what is, what kind of, notice that as this guy's trying to talk about this woman he's, he's involved with, this this other guy is just asking her what this asking what the sex is like. He's completely objectifying this girlfriend, and they're just talking past each other. He's completely obsessed with um, these physical things. It's an interesting uh, it's an interesting book when you actually get out of the academic mindset, um, which tends to miss what things are really about. I, I, that's kind of like the conclusion I tend to come back around to. Uh, Nitaku says, I'm planning on using the typical hero's journey for the skeleton for this one. Is that a good idea? Yes. However, keep in mind it's going to go quickly. And I'm going to show you one that can go very, very quickly with that. Extremely quickly. Um, and it's a very famous story. So I'll show you one that goes really quickly. Um, hope you're okay. If I have two main characters, how do I balance each of their viewpoints throughout the story? There's two approaches. One is if they're both in the scene, then both their viewpoints are really present. Um, when you're writing the prose, you just you don't need to to be inside someone's head too much. Just try to keep away from internal thoughts as much. Or if they're in different places, you can switch scenes. So scene A, it's Billy. Scene B, it's Jessica, whoever the, the characters are. And uh, that way you you are providing the inputs and thoughts and perspectives of both characters by having different scenes with them. Um, and readers will actually pick up on who is the focus of the scene if you're doing third person personal. And you can really easily cue it in by starting with a thought, like in italics, 
um, you know, God, his hair looks like looks like a weed growing up off the side of his head. Jessica thought, "Okay, we're we're in with Jessica's perspective. We're viewing things through Jessica's mind at that point." So there's there's both ways of doing it. You could do omniscient, where you kind of switch back and forth, but that's kind of an older style that's fallen out of favor over the last couple decades. So I probably avoid it. Just you know, there's no there's no technical reason to avoid omniscient at all. It's just not what people are used to these days. What are your thoughts on the uh, his Dark Materials books, The Golden Compass? I never read them. Never read them. Maybe I should. Um, what do you think about? I heard it's like it's like an attempt to be an atheist. Um, you know, uh, wait. Who, who's it an atheist of? I think it was supposed to. Was it supposed to be Narnia? Well, I think it's supposed to be atheist C.S. Lewis, uh, which to me just seemed dumb. <laughs> You know, like uh, atheism, what, what, what do you mean? Like atheism is a thing? Yeah, atheism is, is is really just like a lack of belief. So it's kind of weird to do like an atheist Lewis. Um, what do you think about meta humor and self-aware jokes? Uh, like a character from our world being sucked into a fantasy world and constantly pointing out cliches and tropes we recognize. I think that could be very funny. Um, I think that stuff is actually very funny, personally. I've written, I wrote a screenplay that had that. Um, uh, that was about it's called gamers about people who played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, pretty pretty funny. I think that humor is very funny. But you have to be aware that you're going to be, you know, you'll be playing to the fantasy audience. And if you're playing directly to the fantasy audience, it's a big audience, not a big deal. Uh, Star Wars was a relatively quick adaptation of the hero's journey. Yeah, it's relatively quick, but but you have to think that a twenty thousand word story, it's going to be. Well, I don't know. I mean, you could you could do it. But it should feel shorter than Star Wars. Um, like 20,000 words would be, you know, uh, George George Lucas used to write like these 10-page treatments for the screenplays that would just be a story. Um, and that's super condensed. So 10 pages is still 5,000 words. Um, and that's just saying this happened, this happened, this happened. I'm going to make my Western as a revenge story. Yep, that's good. Main character is a father lost an outlaw and his gang becomes a bounty hunter after his father's murder. Yep, that sounds like a good Western. That that hits it pretty hard. The reason that I have trouble with the editing is that I can't figure out how to get the protagonist out of the dire predicament I put him in. Oh, the ending. Um, <clears throat> so, we'll talk about that A, B, and C story. So, you're going to need some sort of C story that will resolve the dire predicament. And uh, you'll probably have to go back and thread this in actually do a little bit of rewriting to set it up and that's fine um it's it's not that much not that much time lost when you stop and think about it okay let me address a couple of things i got via mail um over the last week so um one is basically there's there's two big ones i want to address one is this idea um this was from i think uh trevor hayes you yeah, have this idea, I, I like arcs in anime and manga. I want to do like a three arc thing. Well, that's exactly what I did with Needle Ash. And it worked out okay. Um, so you could view this as like the first of a three, like a little three book series where each of these represents one act of the story and within each of these is, is a three act structure. That's exactly how Needle Ash is constructed. It's nine total big story areas, um, th or sorry, three big story areas each one divided into three smaller um, plot areas. Uh, so you end up with a nine element structure. It's actually 10. The fourth, the, the third book has a fourth extra act, basically. But uh, that's that's how I set it up. And it worked okay. Um, didn't work as well at gathering attention as I wanted it to, uh, but that's okay. Um, you gotta try some experiments. You gotta you know throw some, throw some stuff at the wall, see what sticks. Uh, so it's okay to try that out. So you can do that. You can look at this as a part one of three and plan out three books and write part one and just put that out. And that that can get your name out there, you get attention. Um, what I did with this is that I sold or I gave away part one. Part, you got part two if you join my mailing list. And then I sold part three. Um, so the idea was to get a lot of click through, get people on the list and get people to buy one of the books. And what really happened is that it's not that people people read book one and then they saw that there was money for book two and then wouldn't join the mailing list and they just stopped after that. <laughs> so that that tends to be what what happens and you know you gotta rate it 
you know, how you want it to happen. So um, the other question I got was just about time management. And time management's a critical one. It's a hard one for me to explain exactly how time management should occur because we all have different lives. But the, the short answer is you have to make time if you want to have time. And although I, my schedule is incredibly booked, I fit a lot of stuff in because I focus very acutely on the things that I need to get done every single day. So if exercise is on the docket, then exercise is on the docket and I do it, you know, before I, before I do other things like play games. Um, and I make sure that I budget time to do whatever writing I'm going to do. So for the drafting phase of this, right now I'm, I'm going to budget one to two hours a day, which is should be plenty for me to actually get this done. Um, that tends to be about all the time I have to work right now anyway. So that's like my maximum amount of work time because of how busy I am. Um, so that's that's more or less what I'm going to be doing. It's hard though. So if, if you are working full time, if you have a laptop, bring your laptop to work right on your breaks, right on your lunch. That's what I did when I was a full-time teacher. I wrote before school, during breaks, during my prep, after school, before I had to do rehearsals, I was a band director, so I was there like 12 hours a day, right? I, I worked more hours than a typical person and I got a lot of writing done because I've focused very intensely on doing it. I also put out a, um, I also put out a podcast every single day for like six months with uh, my brother-in-law who commuted with me. So we recorded the podcast on the way to work uh, I uploaded it during the 15 minute break, union break I had, and I wrote during lunch, wrote during my prep, and uh, of course if I needed to prepare for a class I would do that. I don't want to feel like I'm like skimping on my job or something, but I wrote during my prep if I had an opportunity. I wrote after school before I had rehearsals, and anything that was left over at the end of the day I wrote when I got home. So that way I could write 2,500 or 3,000 words a day, and I got uh, which one? Water of Awakening. They got Water of Awakening done in about a month, right? And that's a 115,000 word book. So I did that in about a month just with tight focusing on what I wanted to do. So the more you focus on what you want to do, you're, the more efficient you're going to get at it too. So if you're able to put two hours a day in, you're going to find that you go from 500 words to 1,000 words to 2,000 words in those two hours a day because you get so much better at being able to focus on it. And your mind is focusing on what you're doing all day long. Planning also helps. If you sit down to write and you have something specifically planned to write, it makes the actual writing experience go much more quickly. So if we do this planning phase really well and you sit down to write something, you're like, oh, I'm on scene 10. What happens in scene 10? And you just start banging out the dialogue and the prose and you get it done. And it makes it way easier if you're able to do that. So it's really hard. It's really hard to do time management when you have a family, you have a full-time job and that kind of stuff. Uh, and believe me, I know my life is very busy as well, but I tend to do like one thing at a time. So when I'm drafting this document, I'm not gonna be working on music. I do YouTube videos one day a week now uh, and then release them throughout the week. So that way my mind is really freed up to focus on the things that I wanna focus on rather than focusing on uh, YouTube stuff. And then I'll check the comments a couple times a week just to see what's up. If I make a really noisy video of a video that generates a lot of a lot of anger towards me I won't be able to look at comments very much not because the negative comments upset me but because they just drown out any uh, other other kinds of conversations so I tend to check comments more during the middle of the week where I can actually sit down and see that people are trying to interact with me rather than over the weekend where people are um, are being highly upset about whatever my hot take is and the hot take is part of my part of my strategy so I do it on purpose um, Let's see here. Another story that gets misinterpreted in schools is Fahrenheit 451. Bradbury meant it to be about the loss of literacy, but it gets it gets misinterpreted as being about censorship. That's exactly correct. Um, I completely agree. So one of the things is that it uh, it's like people wanted the books to be burned because they don't read them. <laughs> you know, um, reading books is what's illegal. People get upset about it. Uh, do you think that thrillers work better? from a first or third person perspective, or does it all depend on the story? It depends on the story. First person perspective, I think works good for things that have a mystery feel to them. Something like a little bit more noir, but uh, third person works really good for thrillers as well. Um, David Stewart and Cody Pennant, he's the sole person left alive in a structure in an isolated location and it's surrounded by malevolent creatures. Well, 
you're going to have to maybe think about a second person in there. I'll talk about the C story. Um, I have a hard time moving from this sounds like a fun setting story to this is the story I'm going to tell in this setting. P.S. Azeroth is flat. No, it's a pyramid. <laughs> I'm resolving the main conflict from the story, but leaving it somewhat open-ended to leave room for a sequel if I choose to make it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to feel like the main, the conflict of the story is sealed up. You know, conflicts that are integral to the setting don't have to be sealed up. So, for instance, Star Wars, the main thing is you got to blow up the Death Star, but it's not... That doesn't mean the Empire is over. <laughs> you know, it could be the end of that story. If they'd never made another Star Wars movie, that first one would be complete as it is. So you want to actually resolve the conflict or people will get a little bit upset. Um, I feel like coming up with the synthesis story, Odysseus, but in medieval America, that's Ulysses, or Cowboys in Mage School isn't enough for to come up with real meat other than set pieces. But it, it, it's enough. Like when you're in the fantasy and sci-fi setting, just mixing genres together is often enough to get people interested. And then, but writing good characters is universal. Writing good plots are universal, and I'll talk about that. What's the best way to change styles? Changing from first person to third person. I don't know how to answer that. Um, usually you're not going to mix them within one book, although I have done that and broken that rule. It would be you're going to rewrite the prose so that it's in third person. Uh, Writers of the Dawn was great. Thank you. So somebody listened to it. When I found out how many there were, I went and watched them all. Get Matt back on. Matt's busy. Um, so, and we don't share commute anymore. I've been using my smartphone. It's working out better than I thought. I need a better Bluetooth keyboard. The Bluetooth keyboard I use is by uh, Pluggable. It comes in this little case and you take it out, clips open. This is a good one. I think I showed this last time. I think it was about $40. It's okay. I think there's a couple that are a little bit better, but it's good. You could put it in a jacket pocket or your poise if you're a purse carrier. Um, got in trouble for writing notes at work this week. Interesting. See, yeah, I don't, I don't worry too much about it. Uh, I have a character with bipolar disorder with a theme of self fear and hatred. How do I keep him from being, from coming off as a crybaby? I don't know. Um, don't have him cry. <laughs> Would be make him not a crybaby. Yeah, don't have him cry. The problem with with writing people who are, um, who have like psychiatric disorders is making them likable because generally. Psych psychiatric disorders disturb people's social ability to be social. And so when we are reading stories about people with psychiatric disorders, we tend to not think of them as lovable people. We tend to think of them as, at best, pitiable people. So you just need to be aware of that. And that your, your main feeling there is you're going to want the audience to pity him and feel sorry for him or feel sorry for his predicament rather than like him. Because we like people for different reasons than we pity them. We like people because they have virtue, but somebody that's severely impaired and needs like psychological or psychiatric treatment, they're really hard to feel like love for, but we do feel pity for them. So if somebody is schizophrenic, you know, I think a schizophrenic character can be very interesting, um, but it's not usually one that you're going to be like, oh, I, I, I love his virtue. It's hard to write virtue for characters whose psychiatric conditions prevent them from exhibiting virtue, which is the case with bipolar. Bipolar can really inhibit people's ability to function socially, to act with good virtue and things. It's not impossible. As long as they're trying, you're going to like that character. So if the character is always trying to do something good, um, but it's probably not going to be a character that people are going to be like, yeah, I love this character or, you know, oh, I want to marry him or something like that more it's going to be kind of on the pity side at least you're probably going to hook them on pity speaking of star wars and books thank you for the super chat michael i do appreciate it came in here to plug ichibaka's uh igg campaign for his new disney star wars is dumb book goal is 30k and we'll have supplementary research and info added there you go um let's see here what else did i miss okay is the popularity of Dave Chappelle's Sticks and Stones Netflix special a good example of anti-fragile marketing? Absolutely. So Dave Chappelle basically told the most offensive jokes he could in the current political climate. So for the right, he told a bunch of political, or not political jokes, a bunch of pedophile jokes, which are kind of anathema to people on the right right now. And then, of course, he told gay, trans, lesbian jokes, jokes about guns, 
uh, jokes about cancel culture, all the stuff that that is kind of anti SGW. And the funny thing is, is that the the all the SGW reviewers for a while had a zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It's gone up to thirty eight percent with ninety nine percent audience approval. So for a while, it was like all the people in the media hated it because they were offended by his jokes, and therefore it wasn't funny um, when. You know, there's a meta level which is it's intended to be offensive and to like uh, to specifically go against to specifically tell the jokes you're not allowed to tell on Twitter. Uh, he did that on purpose, and as a result, it's very funny. So there's an extra meta level humor to it, and the jokes by themselves are funny too. Um, and so the more people bitch about it, the more popular it gets, and it's going to make people are you know renewing their Netflix subscriptions just to watch it. Uh, it's good. Um, I thought it was very funny. I think it's going to be remembered as the new George Carlin thing. Um, so I think that, you know, the the seven words you can't say on, on TV, I think this will be the new one uh, because of that. And that was the same idea. It's like I'm going to tell the things that you're not allowed to tell. Um, go minus. Would switching point of views have been stalker and stalky kill the tension? Oh, I want things that terrify the person being stalked to be comical misunderstandings. I don't know. You could try it. That might be funny. That might be interesting. You got it. Tr- so the first rule is break the rules. <laughs> All right. Film girl, glad you're okay. I am okay. I have a rough idea for the villain in my story, but I'm struggling with creating him and making him seem like a character and trying to give him a good storyline. Hmm. Um, as long as he's bad on some level, you don't have to go too deep with the villain. How do you introduce fantasy elements into a story? Example... An urban setting that slowly becomes more supernatural over time. Hmm. I could just do it when, uh, so when we're planning it out, you want to do it, you know, if you're, if you're doing scene by scene planning, decide on which element you're going to introduce when. Okay. Um, apologies for off topic, but what are the first books that got you into literature? I am not into literature. I hate literature. I like books. Um, so there are no books that got me into literature, only books that made me dislike it. Um, for writing people with psychological issues relying heavily on internal myelog can help uh, expressly with BPD show the frustration with his lack of control. Yeah, that's, in, that's I mean, so if you have a, a, a first person perspective in an internal monologue, then you're really, you really can express a lot of, of that. But then the story on some level is about like borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, um, something like that. Borderline personality disorder. I mean, I, I find personality disorders very interesting, but I can't think of a character that would be like, I like this character, and part of what makes me like them is the fact that they have BPD. It's more like they are destroyed by their psychological condition, and that's part of the interest of the story. We pity them. Um, that's my feeling, though. You know, you you could defy that and do something great otherwise. Have you heard of uh, Micah Curtis? He has a ch- I haven't. Uh, maybe I have. Inglewood. That boy. That sounds familiar. I'm gonna. I'm gonna Google it real quick. You know, I th- I heard of this comic, but I don't know him. Um, so I think I've seen this like on Twitter, but I haven't, I haven't heard of him. Sorry. Um, why does it seem high fantasy is usually in third person? Third person is the general way to write prose that makes sense. Not all high fantasy is in third person. Amber's in first person. There's lots of first person high fantasy, actually. Uh, Black Company is in first person. There's a lot of first person. Uh, how do you go about introducing a magic system into the story? So the the case example would be Way of Kings by um, by Sanderson by Brandon Sanderson. So what he does at the beginning, and I have a whole video on this by the way, called like Magic uh, Fantasy Does Not Excuse. I'm trying to remember, Excuse Impossibility or something like that. It's about magic systems. So in uh, in Way of Kings, he has this scene at the beginning that's tightly focused on this assassin and he's doing all this magic. And so the way he does the magic 
basically lays out the magic system that you find out about later in the book. So it sets it all off. It shows it to you. It tells the reader up front that this this is a magical world. This is magic. The people that are that are reacting to the magic don't know how to deal with it. Then you just do it indirectly from then on. You just show the characters using the magic, and that's how people figure out that it exists. So that's I think that's a great case story. Uh, Brandon Sanderson does introduction of magic and magic systems generally pretty well. Um, so he's a really good one to look at for that kind of thing. I'm a more seat of your pants writer. You can do it either way. I'm, I'm going to focus on on plotting for this. It could be a good idea for ni, uh, for Nitaka Dragon Soul to study Poe as, as an example, for Hal to handle characters with psychological problems. I You can. I think Poe's great, but I don't think it's the best example. It's probably not the... I mean, Catcher in the Rye is a good one, since we're thinking of that one. Um, it's more about how you show the, the reader what the problem is. There's no specific way to go about it. You kind of have to do it the way that you feel is actually showing what you want to show. You have to you have to exert your mind and your your credentials a little bit. Um, all right, so let's talk about planning. Let's transition and we'll talk a little bit about uh, planning. So here's what you need to do to plan. I'm I have a, a word document. Uh, I'm going to share it with the the mailing list after this. Um, basically, because think people it's nice to have worksheets this isn't a worksheet so much as like a, a set of questions to answer when you're doing the planning and I have a, a short planning document I started on the story that I'm gonna write so I'm gonna write one with you guys so I'll have a story to put out at the end of the six weeks um, that'll be good and that'll be that uh, let's take a look so bum, bum, bum. all right here it is planning your book. That's the first thing that we talked a little bit about last week is meta planning. So your book's genre and subgenre. I'll tell you for mine, you know, I put this stuff over here, space opera. And the subgenre would actually be something more like Warhammer 40k. You know, I could actually put it in the Warhammer 40k category, though it's not Warhammer 40k at all. Um, but it's very close to that, which would be, you know, religious space opera, things like that. Uh, proposed length, 20 to 30K words is the length I'm recommending. Of course, you can do longer. It's up to you. You can do whatever you want. If you want to write that 100,000 word book this time, go for it. It's just going to take you longer to complete um, in general. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, it just means that you'll be working on this for a while. Um, your budget. So I talked about that. Zero to $150 is what I recommend. Okay. Um, once you get past 150 bucks, if it's your first book, you are really going to be taking a long time to recover that. It takes a long time to make your first hundred bucks. You know, it took months for me to make a hundred dollars on Amazon, and then started making a hundred bucks a month. You know, and then you're making more than that, like five hundred a month. It just depends. Um, so when you're when you have a cover, spending on a cover, you can get a comp, very competent cover for fifty dollars for most genres. High fantasy is harder, but you can get a competent cover. So a competent cover is the main thing you should spend on. If you want to spend on editing, a lot of people want to, to pay an editor to tell them what they need to fix. That's up to you. I'm going to I'm gonna approach this as if we are not going to be using an editor because it's a short book, because this is your first book, because you just need to get it out, because it's about the, the whole process. Uh, and editing is going to add a bunch of extra time because you have to hire someone to look at your writing and uh, tell you things, and then you decide to change them. Um, your expected time per day on the project. So I said mine would be about one to two hours. So a thousand dollar, a thousand words a day is what you need to be able to write during drafting. A thousand plus. So you need to to budget the amount of time that's necessary to actually complete the the task. If you're not budgeting one to three hours, chances are you're not you're not doing quite enough time. But here's another thing too. If you're setting a word count goal, that's gonna force you to do it correctly regardless. So if you say, I need to, I need to write a 1500 words a day, if it takes you five hours, it takes you five hours. If it takes you one hour, it takes you one hour. You know, whatever you need to do. All right, first part of planning. Um, we're gonna talk about the setting. So the, the things that you wanna 
talk about the setting of the genre variations. So, you know, for mine, actually, let's turn off, uh, turn off tabs. I usually show tab characters to keep track of where tabs actually are because it's better to use indents. Anyway, so, you know, it's space, it's gonna be sci-fi, you know, a variety of different planets or realms. I'm discarding traditional interstellar travel and making it more transdimensional. I'm some, I want to go back to early 20th century stuff because that's more fantastical to me. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, and so you would write anything like that. Okay, it's going to be science fiction, but it's going to be on Earth or it's going to be science fiction. You travel th through different planets by folding space like Dune. You know, you write all that stuff down there. Uh, other planets are like this. You know, the planet that they're on has tentacle trees or something. Um, you want to write down all the little variations. It's um, you could even do a log line thing. It's, it's like Star Trek, but with paladins, right? <laughs> so there you go. Um, mine is like paladins in space, right? Space paladins, not space marines, but space paladins. It's essentially like a supernatural religious story. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I had a bunch of dreams about it last night. And so I woke up, I'm like, oh, I'm going to plan this book. Um, places, this is going to be where the story takes place. So if you're writing a thriller and it takes place in like Dallas, Texas, you'd write Dallas, Texas. You'd write any places that you're going to travel to during the course of that because if people are moving to different cities, you're going to write those down. Um, you're going to write any differences from modern culture, if any. So if you're writing it in our world, you don't, you don't really need to write that down. But if you're writing it in like, you know, the past, you know, medieval period, write down any notes that you want. If you're writing a fantasy story, write down any notes that you want. You know, they use this as money. They worship these gods. That can be sometimes incredibly long and detailed, depending on how much world building you want to do. A lot of fantasy writers spend a lot of time world building. Others just kind of, they just kind of go for it. Um, technology and magic, if any. So if you're writing a sci-fi or fantasy story, you'd write how the magic works. You'd write how the technology works. So uh, a science fiction story that has enhanced technology, interstellar travel, maybe, you know, um, neuro links, something like that. Uh, whatever kind of phaser rifles, whatever kind of technology is going to be important to the story or part of the setting. Uh, and then other any other miscellaneous notes. So that's the stuff that you want to fill out. Um, the setting stuff, you don't have to be as specific as some people are. You want to list the things that you know you're going to use in the story. So for instance, with places, you don't need to list, if, if you're imagining a sci-fi or a space opera story that has 500 planets, you don't need to list all 500 planets. You just need to think about the one or two planets that you're going to uh, be adventuring on. So if you think about Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie, you're only on one planet. You know, and the second Star Wars movie has three, and the third Star Wars movie has the first planet again, and then Endor. So there are very few planets in the original trilogy of Star Wars. Um, likewise, in Star Trek, you know, like one planet per week. So if you're writing a Star Trek story, you really only need to think about the one planet that you're writing the story on, um, and the fact that there's different planets is just part of the general the general background. Let's see if there's any questions on that before we go on. Um, what settings would work in open office? Uh, that's uh, that's going to be a question for some other time. But I'll just tell you, like when you're actually drafting, um, I don't use open office, but you want a style in Microsoft Word that basically describes what you're doing. So if I hit modify, it's twelve point times New Roman. If I go to paragraph, it'll be. Um, indent the first space by 0.5 inches and then you would do double spacing for manuscript format manuscript formats double space times new roman 0.5 inch margins now when you want to change this to be an ebook you can just dial that down to 0.25 or whatever um, you want it to be usually 0.2 or 0.25 for a paperback book because you're, you're doing it on a smaller page and then you're going to be changing, you know, the margins and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So you, you go over to like margins, uh, margins would be under page layout. So you go margins. So this is one inch margins. When you actually do this, I'll, I'll go into as much depth as you need to 
to format the interior of a, of a paperback, but you end up doing like half inch margins uh, with a gutter um, and some other things like that to make sure that the book comes out looking really good. And most people think my, my paperbacks come out looking fairly decent. So keep that in mind. I do all my paperbacks in Microsoft Word, which is cheap and works really well. Um, Got to back, get back to work. Thanks for stopping by, Cody. I appreciate it. What settings would work? Okay, uh, what do you think of having your spouse help edit? It's fine. Depends what you mean by edit. So there's different levels of editing. I'll talk about this when we get to editing. There's story editing or structure editing, which is what you need to change about the story. There's copy editing, which is where you're fixing style elements. Then there's proofreading, which is fixing spelling mistakes or typos or various formatting issues. Each of those has a different purpose. So when people say editing, what they often mean is proofreading, but editing is something completely different. Copy editing is something completely different from editing. So most copy editors, you know, most copy editors are going to suggest style changes. Most editors, they may suggest style changes, but they'll probably suggest story changes. They could suggest style changes though, but most copy editors are not gonna tell you things about your story. That's not why you're hiring them. You're hiring them to make your pros like work better. Um, and then, uh, you know, proofreaders are just there to get typos. So they go, they should descend in, in terms of expense. Structure editors usually charge the most. To me, I actually consider them the ones with the least skin in the game. Copy editors have maybe slightly more skin in the game. Um, but the proofreaders have the most because if there's any spelling mistakes, it's they get in trouble. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Anyway, let's see here. So yeah, you can use your you can use your spouse to do whatever. If if your spouse is really good at giving you feedback, give feedback. The the, the value of an editor is that you're only dealing with the feedback of one person um, versus having beta readers or something give a bunch of different kinds of feedback. Um, Sometimes it's better to just think of what one person thinks and to like have a person who really knows what they're what they're talking about. Hopefully, tell you what they think uh, rather than having a bunch of random people. Um, so it's up to you. What do you think? Let's see here. Have you ever seen uh, it was all a dream twist done right? The Matrix, but it wasn't all a dream. Um, let me think. What was it? Vanilla Sky was actually a remake of Obra Los Ojos. That one was good. And that one was very good, actually. I could probably think of more if I spent time thinking about it. Um, oh, Vampire Hunter D, the second novel? Chaser of Gales, or whatever it was. We can read the English translation, but yeah, it has a, it's an all a dream thing. Uh, that, it, that They did it pretty well. Um, Who's the guy who wrote it? His name escapes me. Um, my setting is a modern town being teleported into a magical world. What would part three be? Should I just focus on the fantasy world? I'd focus on the differences because those are the things you need to accent. So if they dress differently, they have different gender attitudes, those are the things that you should find time to describe. Um, how do you create a belief system or religion in world building without that allows the audience to suspend their belief of the system? I don't know. You'll have to figure that out for yourself. I'm trying to set up my story in like an AU modern fantasy world. Would it be better to just come up with random places and names for things or not? I don't know. Uh, how do you come up with good names? So I start with um, whatever inspires me to that location. And then I come up with variations of that. So if I feel like it's, you know, for um, Needle Ash, it was Northern northern Italy. So I just made names that were kind of variations on Northern Italian kind of things. So an Italian wouldn't read it and be like, well, he might read it and be like, this sounds like a variation of Italian. But it, he wouldn't say it and be like, this is bad Italian. It's like not, it's like, oh, this is like reminiscent of Italian. Um Reminiscent of Sardinian or whatever. So that's how I do it. Uh, my magic system is based off disorders. 
schizophrenia, depression, addiction, antisocial, PTSD are all connected to physics. Interesting. I mean, there's a it's an interesting thing to do where madness and power are together. Um, and, you know, they're linked. I'm trying to think if someone's done that before, but if something's not coming to mind. Like, the more you use your power, the crazier you get. That'd be interesting. Um, Mateus says uh, he's living the series. Well, I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. Let's go on to characters. So characters are the meat of your story. Once you have the setting, this is, these are the rule. It's the rule system is your setting. These are the things which are important to not violate. It's kind of the hemming it in. And you're going to expose the setting mostly in the first act. So when you talk about characters, here's for this kind of short novel, the, the stuff that you really need to include. And you can plan this out ahead of time. You want a protagonist. You want to think about what that protagonist's strengths are. You want to think about a fatal flaw. So not just a flaw, but let's call it a fatal flaw. This is the uh, this is the flaw that will either cause the character's downfall or cause the character to have a significant setback on their road to victory. This is uh, very important because it works in the plot in a way that I'll show you, and it's also very important to have a fatal flaw because it humanizes the character and makes them more likable. So if a character has a significant amount of hubris, pride, and they suffer because of that pride and must adjust themselves, it makes the audience like them more and identify with them more because it's a personal struggle that they're able to overcome. If the character lacks faith and learns to gain faith, that's going to be a fatal flaw. If the character is a kleptomaniac, that could be a fatal flaw. I would pick a fatal flaw, though, that is general. Something like pride, something like, say, being too easily swayed by the opposite sex, which is what I'm going to use in mine, right? So the temptations of the opposite sex, the temptations of the flesh are a fatal flaw. If somebody can be led astray by a woman, it can cause major problems. Now, this is the fatal flaw of Indiana Jones, actually, now that I think about it. So if you watch Indiana Jones, his fatal flaw is women. And the fatal flaw, at least in the third Indiana Jones movie, really comes home because he gets involved with this German woman, I think Elsa is her name, and he's constantly, even at the end, he's trying to save her life. And she refuses to have her life saved. And he almost dies and through that learns to like let go of, of the chalice and let his father save him, you know. Um, so it's an interesting twist, but it causes him lots of problems because she betrays him. So that's a good one. Um, so the main one is a protagonist. The second character you can think about, you don't have to include a character like this, is a love interest. The love interest would play into what's called a B story. You can include a B story, but keep in mind it's going to pad your document a little bit. B story is usually a romance. So... Um, a love interest character is one that uh, can distract the protagonist that the protagonist is interested in, that the protagonist cares about, the protagonist grows closer to, uh, or the love interest can be kind of a second protagonist. When I wrote Muramasa, the love interest is just the other protagonist. There's two main protagonists, and the B story is about them you know, recognizing their feelings for one another. The third one's an antagonist. You don't have to have an antagonist. If your story's like man versus wild or something, then obviously you don't need an antagonist, but it's good to have one. And so for each of these, you want to give them a name and you want to describe them in some way. What's their physical, what do they physically look like? What's their history? What's their demeanor? Uh, and then if they have any strengths or any flaws. So maybe if you have a protagonist, the love interest is a girl, you know, she's smarter maybe than the protagonist. Um, but her fatal flaw is that she, you know, she gets seduced by bad boys, right? This would be a really standard plot. It's like you have a protagonist. He likes the girl. The girl is a bookworm and a goody two-shoes, but she's attracted to bad boys, which prevents her from having happiness. And then the B story is that the main character having to, you know, gain enough of whatever he needs to for her to like him and for her to overcome her fatal flaw. That'd be pretty standard. Um, antagonist would be, you know, whoever's working against the main character. So um, in some cases, you don't have one. 
And the antagonist doesn't need to be super fleshed out. That's not that necessary. Like Sauron, what are Sauron's character traits? You know, what's the character traits of Iran? Um, you know, you can have a, a good, very disgusting, like I think it like Duke Harkonnen. Like Harkonnen's a really good, really good antagonist. So uh, you want your antagonist to have traits which make him hated. So if you look at Dune, like what he did with Harkonnen is he made Harkonnen physically disgusting. So you would be disgusted anytime he's on screen. If you're watching the movie or he's in the book, you're just, you hate him. You hate his guts. And that's, uh, that's part of it. Now he's interesting because of other things, but his disgustingness is what makes you hate him. So whenever you have an antagonist, think about how you're going to make that antagonist hated. Um, maybe that he's a liar or, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, and then the fourth one would be a best friend. And this would be part of the, um, I said part of the B story, really part of the C story. Um, let me correct that. So the C story is usually the best friend having his own little subplot where he, you know, he's he's kind of the support to the protagonist and he kind of levels up and becomes a hero like with, with Sam Wise or he, like with Han Solo, he has a an introspective moral revelation that alters his behavior and then he's the one who causes the resolution of the of the plot he's the one who saves the main character uh so if you think about abc in, in protagonist uh, i'll talk about abc right now but um actually i did empire strikes back for for abc as the example but you know your protagonist in star wars would be luke your love interest would be leia even though luke and leia don't actually get together that's how it is in the movie uh, the antagonist would be Darth Vader, and the best friend would be Han Solo. Uh, and so each of those have an ABC story. The A story is Luke's got to figure out how to blow up the Death Star with Obi Wan, who's a. And then of course any other characters are going to have um, uh, other supporting characters. Um, and you don't have to have these; you can break all the rules. So other supporting characters in Star Wars would be like Obi Wan, right? All that kind of stuff. And I tend to just list characters and I can refer back to them as much as I want. Let's see here. Before we get into the plotting element. So this is the part most people ask about is plot. How do I write a good plot? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And I'll give you some that aren't in this worksheet. But I'm going to distribute this worksheet to my mailing list. So make sure you're on the mailing list. And um, I'll include it for you. And that way you can just have it as a reference forever. Uh, for free. Let's see here. Have you ever read uh, Mythago Wood? It's a renowned fantasy novel about a forest that causes the myths, legends, etc. that a person has heard to come true for them. I haven't read it. Uh, I had a class on creative writing where we learned how to write fiction via short stories. Do you think this is a good idea? It's not the worst idea. So here's the thing about writing short stories. Short stories, you you're having to leave out a bunch of things that matter for the stories that really matter to you. So writing short stories doesn't always translate into writing novels and there's because there's a whole lot more that goes into writing a novel. So you will learn how to write prose and to a certain extent how to write dialogue. But dialogue you write for a short story has to be more compact and to the point than dialogue you write for a longer story. In fact, the more dialogue you discard, the more efficient and shorter the story can be to the point where you can get like some Lovecraft stories where there's no dialogue at all. So the no dialogue at all in some Lovecraft stories, it lets you tell the story very quickly. Um, you can tell a story much more quickly through prose than for dialogue, but dialogue is what makes you connect with characters. So if you're writing a longer story where characters matter, you can have more dialogue. So yes, you will learn to write prose, but there's a bunch of stuff you're not going to learn. So you're not going to learn the stuff I'm going to talk about right now for the most part. Um, you're not going to learn how to manage a plot on a large enough scale to produce a 100,000 plus word document um, or an epic novel or something like that. You're not going to – you probably won't learn how to – It's a, fundamentally short story writing is just a different style too. So although you can learn how to write good sentences, you may not learn – how to write good sentences for a longer book versus a shorter book or how those styles change. And I could do some content in the future that just digs into the, the deeper differences between those two. Um, 
most people, here's the last thing I'll say about it. Most people who start writing short fiction, they write it because it's easier than writing long fiction. In fact, that's what we're, we're writing a short novel, not a long novel, because it's easier and it's a um, shorter amount of time to focus on the project. But they start writing short fiction uh, because writing a longer fiction is too intimidating, uh, but they don't ever read short fiction. So you're missing a lot of the tools that you would need to actually write short fiction. So if you're, if you like short fiction, if you like short stories, then writing short fiction is great. You know, I like short fiction and uh, I read it, but most people I meet who want to write and be a writer and create a book, they want to create something bigger and they primarily just read novels so in that case it's you know you want to get to writing a novel <laughs> is is your goal um and you you don't want to spend a whole lot of time like let me write 20 short stories i've had people say that that helped them and it can help you write prose but i it's you're just going to be missing a lot of stuff that's necessary for a longer work um bpd controls hot and cold depression is like a ghost addiction controls gravity that's weird it might be interesting Try to see it out to the end. Um, George says, I love world building, but I fear my story will just become explaining the world how, and how it became so. Just avoid info dumps. Just describe the characters and the characters know the world and that's how the reader comes to know the world. Go to complete indirect exposition and you don't even have to worry about that. Oh yes, in Wheel of Time, the male magic did drive them mad. You're correct. So the more they used it, the more crazy they went. That's from Nitaku. There's also um, uh, an anime and a manga called Claymore where like the more you used your, they had like some sort of demonic magic inside them. Like there was, they had like partial demon blood or something. And the more they used it, the closer they became to just like fully giving in to the demonic blood and becoming a demon, um, which was kind of interesting. You were always kind of like trying to go up to the edge of that. Thoughts on adding a dead or dead characters into the story for world building purposes. Like they're historical figures in the narrative uh, and are central to the plot in some way. Have other characters talk about them. There you go. Uh, what about using the seven deadly sins as a template for fatal flaws? Good idea or pretentious? I think it's a good idea because each of those, um, I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. Something like gluttony. Gluttony's a, People tend to think of gluttony as like you, uh, you're you eating food, but it's really just uh, physical pleasures are kind of gluttony, right? Like you're gluttonous when it comes to drink. You drink too much, you eat too much, uh, you're too focused on having things taste good. And so that usually results in you being fat, right? Being overweight uh, because you don't control your consumption. But there's other things that happen. Addiction is part of gluttony. I think historically, you could easily put addiction as part of gluttony. You're not able to restrict your use of a substance or um, whatever it happens to be. Uh, I think those are good. Like wrath, wrath means that you can't, you don't have enough mercy, you have anger. You you hurt people because out of, out of anger rather than any kind of justice. And of course, that's gonna cause bad problems for you. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, my characters can gain power from having more self-control and cunning. Hmm. Uh, would recklessness and a mindset which makes them put themselves in danger without caring about whether they live or die classes fatal flaws? Yes. Yeah, totally. Recklessness is a fatal flaw. Literally, it'll kill you. So maybe a character is reckless and... His recklessness, he, he like he's really lucky and he always comes out of it clean, but in going into the third act, it doesn't work and he gets very severely injured and has to rethink his strategy. Totally. Um, not to go into Dune for too long, but the Baron Harkonnen was more of an interesting character in the book. He may have been horrendous physically, but he had strong intellect. He was more... Yeah, he, I think he was interesting. His motivations were interesting. He had great plans, but he was physically revolting, and so it immediately made you hate him as an antagonist. It was beautiful. That's something you could do is just give somebody something revolting, like in, um, you know, give him a rotten face or something or, you know, whatever. He was so fat, he had to have robots carry him around. Um... Not in this one, but in one of my books, I had the sea story be the best friend evolving into the main antagonist. That's often a good a good idea. So you can have the the best friend be tempted 
be tempted to the dark side and it makes a great twist it makes a great twist i've used it uh, my story would be pretty straightforward revenge yes that's a good idea i think that's good for western setting uh, are you familiar with tim powers novel on stranger tides it's about blackbeard trying to find the fountain of youth and features mermaids they poorly based pirates of the caribbean 4 on it i think i saw pirates 4 i, I but i don't remember it <laughs> and i don't remember tim powers novel i don't think i read it um seven deadly sins are lust sloth gluttony wrath greed envy pride virtues being chastity diligence temperance patience charity kindness humility yeah charity is the only virtue that can ex can come from christ if you if you guys like aquinas aquinas i like uh reading aquinas on on like virtue ethics great stuff but yeah so seven deadly sins each of those are things which lead people astray so if it leads you astray then it's going to cause your downfall things like pride things pride is is going to be hubris so if you're reading shakespeare that the fatal flaw or the tragic flaw we call it a tragic flaw um usually we don't want to think of it as a tragic flaw unless we're writing a tragedy and the tragic flaw is what causes the downfall of the character their pride their hubris their arrogance causes them to not fully evaluate what they're doing all right let's talk about plotting for a bit um so a plot is an event sequence i tend to think of plot in a whole bunch of different ways now i don't usually think of abc stories but it really helps a lot of people to figure out what each scene is going to be part of and what they need to be writing as they're writing it um, so typical abc story goes with a three-act plot structure and the a story is going to be the main conflict or the main plot goal blow up the death star it's going to be throw the ring into the fires of mount doom that's the a story it's the primary plot the main driver of the protagonist the antagonist and everything else the b story is most often a romance but it usually has to do with some kind of resolution of personal tension is the b story so b story is usually interpersonal tension and you know uh, the two characters don't get along the the fellowship is fracturing you're in love with a female character or, or a male character you're in love with a different character and that has to matriculate in some sense um, and in order for that to matriculate there's usually personal growth that has to happen people have to resolve their issues in order for them to be compatible and actually have a relationship and the c story is most often a tertiary story that involves a secondary character either the antagonist it's the antagonist story is the c story or it's a secondary plot that um like the best friend resolves something in order to fulfill something that's missing from the final goals of the final act and then causes the resolution of the entire plot um, so that's abc story the example i use was empire strikes back because it's a really good one for this it uses a standard three act uh, setup so the a story is luke has to train to be a jedi to overcome the empire and darth vader so the main plot goal is we have to beat vader i have to power up to beat vader that's the that's the story the b story is han and leia have a romance pretty obvious pretty straightforward they're put in a stressful situation that causes them to recognize romantic feelings towards one another and indeed the b story is actually established in the first act c story is darth vader luring luke to cloud city so he's chasing han and leia once he captures them once his machinations come to capture them that causes the third act to be set up and to force luke to face him when luke isn't ready and that of course the empire strikes back which is kind of an odd duck uh the protagonist loses you know the main guy loses now if you're uh defining protagonist as the person actually acting darth vader is actually the protagonist so in empire strikes back the actual protagonist is darth vader and everybody else is reacting to him because it's his plans that are being set in motion uh, anyway let's take a look at any more chat for this um the tragic flaw of julius caesar being pride now julius caesar was was prideful and ignored the omens of the gods but if we're looking at shakespeare's tragedy of julius caesar it's funny because the tragedy is actually not about julius, julius caesar but brutus and cassius brutus in particular whose 
tragic flaw is that he is willing to sacrifice the means for the end. That means he's willing to commit murder in order to achieve, uh, in order to, quote, save the Republic. And through doing that, he actually empowers Octavius um, and Mark Antony to overthrow the Republic, have the triumvirate, and eventually Augustus becomes emperor. So the tragedy of Julius Caesar, if you're looking at the Shakespeare play, isn't really about Julius Caesar at all. Brutus is the actual tragic hero in that one. Um, and, the, you know, pride is the tragic flaw of Satan in Paradise Lost. So Paradise Lost is kind of a tragedy of Satan, Lucifer, and uh, his, his fatal flaw is he doesn't want to submit to God's will. He's too prideful. Uh, I'm writing a realistic novel in the best style of Henry Miller, Charles uh, Bukowski, and uh, Mikado de, C uh, uh, de Assis. It feels uh, like I'm the only one. All advice I found is geared towards epic fantasies. Advice? Well, uh, the the setting advice isn't going to matter, but the plot advice will, and the characters will. So you want a protagonist that's going to have a strength, that's going to be likable. You want an antagonist, same thing. You want a love interest that has some kind of fatal flaw that prevents her from getting with the protagonist, uh, all that stuff. I'm thinking of mixing a cyberpunkish story with a racing contest. Think of 80s John Cusack film meets uh, Acura meets Alex Jones. <laughs> Makes me think of like Alita or uh, Venus Force. But it could be good. Yeah. It'd be fun. Um, anyway, for, for Mateus, you know, uh, if I talk a lot about fantasy, it's because it's primarily what I write. And it's what a lot of people that I know who watch this stuff are into. doesn't mean you can't write it. It just means the setting is going to be more in the familiar real world, which means there's less less work to do thinking about setting. You don't have to do world building. You just have to think about making great characters and what their tra traits are and then figuring out the event structure. Let's see here. Medieval America, A story pilgrimage to Mount Rushmore, B story night and Neo Norse romance, C story knight has to save his monk friend who put himself in danger, I think. It'd be more like the monk saves the knight who who gets trapped by the antagonist. So the antagonist traps the knight for the C story, and the monk, his best friend, has to save him. But the monk, of course, has to abandon his vow of peace of nonviolence. Maybe he takes a vow of like not hurting people or whatever. He has to abandon that vow to be a hero to save his friend. That would be the actual C story. So so typically the C story helps revolve, resolve the A story. Let's take a look at the structure, the act structure. There's no hard act structure when you're writing like this. Now you can divide it formally. You can have a heading. This is act one, act two. If you're watching a drama, obviously you have breaks between acts. Shakespeare uses a five act structure. I'll describe that one afterwards. I don't recommend, well, you can do a five act structure if you want. You do whatever act structure you, you feel like um, appeals to you. The three act structure is what is most common in literature. It's what's, therefore, it's what's most common in movies as well um, and vice versa. They influence each other. So a, a three act structure, there's no hard delineation between these. There's no rules, no rules for how long each one of these must last. So it's not one third, one third, one third. It could be half. A third and like a tiny bit for act three it could be however you want it just depends what you want to do in each of these so no hard and fast rules and if there were rules you feel free to break the rules um so exposition and conflict formation that is act one so the beginning of your story is going to focus entirely on introducing the main characters exposing the world that they live in and creating what people usually refer to as the main conflict and what I often call the initial plot goals, the primary plot goals. So just as an example, if you're writing something maybe that takes place in our world, you're going to introduce the character in a way that lets the audience know what that character is like and what they're doing. So maybe they're a detective in New York, right? So you're going to write some scenes of them being a detective in New York that shows them acting, interacting with another character and shows their personality coming out and then you're going to introduce some conflict something that makes the protagonist act his wife was found dead his wife was murdered and he's the primary suspect there's your conflict for this this story now while he is trying to uh, avoid being prosecuted for this he's also trying to investigate the murder and so now you have a really 
a fleshed out possible plot with this with this kind of a uh, crime story uh, that I just made up on the spot. So here you introduce the protagonist, you expose certain details of their personality, preferably by demonstrating them through action um, or through dialogue, uh, and expose critical setting details. So critical setting details are those setting details which are going to have an impact deep into the story. So if you're writing science fiction, you need to expose the details, you need to show the audience that there's interstellar travel, for instance, if there's interstellar travel. If you think of something like Star Wars, the first shot is spaceships. So it lets you know right away that they're spaceships. Um, and uh, if you're reading Dune right away, you've got uh, traveling to another planet. So it lets you know, and you've got talk about spice and all that kind of stuff. So you've got a lot of that stuff that's exposed. And then by the end of Act 1, there should be some event that has to put into motion everything the protagonist has to do. It motivates the protagonist to act or puts the protagonist uh, on a defensive where they have to run away. So in Dune, it was the betrayal of, of the Atreides house um, by Harkonnen and the Emperor um, that killed off Paul's family, but he somehow survives. Act two, he'd be going into the desert, um, right? So the end of your first act, your first big story area, the transition should always be, it shouldn't always be, but I'm going to say always, feel free to break the rules, guys. It should be a, some significant event that forces the protagonist to do something. Uh, if you look at Star Wars, Star Wars, the main plot goal is blow up the Death Star, but what forces the protagonist to act? It's finding the droids and then his parents or his, his aunt and uncle get murdered, which means that he has no reason to resist you know, the call to adventure or whatever it is and has to decides to go off with Obi-Wan. So there's some significant set of events that encapsulate the conflict and make the protagonist do something. So if by the end of the first third of what you're doing, you don't have the conflict established, it might be a problem. Now, a couple of technical things that I've done on longer books. In my opinion, the earlier you get to the conflict, the better off you're going to be. Because the more interested the reader is going to be in resolving the conflict. So if you're taking 100 pages to introduce a conflict, it's probably taking too long. Now you can take 100 pages to get the protagonist to act with that transitionary event, but you want to get the conflict early. So in Star Wars, it's blow up the Death Star right away. It's in the opening credits. It's in that, that role, right? When I did it in Muramasa, the conflict is literally on the first page. You know, it's just this little thing. This is Muramasa Blood Drinker. You probably can't see it. It just, you know, it talks about this murder he commits. And then in the first page, you get the main character, um, uh, Tauku Yoshio, and he's uh, he's investigating a murder. He's looking at this murder, and he's pursuing the killer. So we get this idea that the main goal is, I'm going to kill this guy because he harmed, he harmed, he harmed my master in some level. You know, I've been assigned to kill him. That's part of my duty is to kill this guy, right? Um, so the earlier you get into that conflict, in my opinion, the better. If you can introduce the conflict on the first page, you're probably doing okay. Now, I'm actually not going to do that on my book. On my book, I'm going to have a completely expositional scene to introduce it. Then we're going to have the primary conflict get established. But the expositional scene is going to be intensely interesting on its own. Uh, it's going to be a scene where a dude kills a demon and then executes a person for bringing the demon in the world. Very bloody, very violent, very exciting. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so if it's not exciting on the first page, you might lose some people. I don't recommend you begin books the way that Lord of the Rings begins, for instance. I love Lord of the Rings, but modern readers, they get bored reading about hobbit parties and this kind of slow building of tension. <laughs> Instead, what would have been better would be to start with like a murder or something like that. Get people really on the on their heels. Let's take a look at chat before I talk about Act 2. A protagonist, maybe two, a villain, a mentor, and maybe a best friend. Or two, that's the characters I'm leaning towards using. Absolutely, great. So a mentor, you know, that, that there, we could put that in there. That's optional, right? A mentor is going to be a character that just provides motivation and information for the protagonist to act correctly. 
Um, that's a really good one to put in there. An, an Obi Wan like character, a character that's like um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the character in Dune, but I'm, I'm forgetting his name because it's been so long. So I apologize. Um, a character that really acts as a guide to help the protagonist make sense, especially in Act Two, which is the Chaos Act. I'm going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> The style of my story is a naturally developing in first-person Lovecraftian style, but I'm having a hard time figuring out how to translate that into a novel rather than a short story. Well, it's going to be a short novel for this project. So instead of thinking about, I have to make it a, a short novel, why don't you just let it be what it's going to be? And if it's only 10,000 words, then it's a 10,000 word short read and you could put it out just like that. Or you could you could sell it to a collection or something maybe, you know? So just let it be what it's going to be. Um, don't try to add more stuff in to make it longer. And these are just these are just t tips. These are just a way that you can construct a story. So if you're constructing a different story, just let it be that way. And then um, you can think about some of these for the next one that you write. It's okay if it's a 10,000 word story or even a 5,000 word story, as long as it's the story that you want to write and it does the things that you want it to do. Um, ready, set, go. A beautiful male wizard must deal with his face being melted during an encounter with a demonic threat. The A story is how he quests to find a cure for his deformatory. B plot, necromancy. <laughs> okay, I like it. I like it already. It makes me think of um, the first Drizzt book, which was, I don't remember the name of it, by uh, uh, R.A. Salvatore, where he has a, a wizard who's had his face melted by acid, and he gets killed, and so another wizard takes his place. But in order to take his place and, and hide from those who are trying to kill him, he has to melt his face with acid. I uh, love it. Uh, Nitaku, I'm thinking of starting the book with the protagonist losing a fight with the bully. Excellent way to start a book. Start a, Excellent way to start it. Because here's what you got. You got the bully, so you have a bad guy that you can focus on. You have a fight, which is exciting. And you have somebody lose that fight, which makes you have pity and makes you get on their side and if they lose the fight bravely if they try to fight back and they get their butt kicked then they're exhibiting virtue which also makes the reader like them so the more you know let's say he gets in a fight with a bully by standing up to the bully or even better standing up for a third party the the bully is teasing the kid with scoliosis and he's like you leave him alone and then they fight and he loses the fight he gets beat up or something right well we love that character already for standing up for somebody else. It's a great example to show uh, some kind of virtue. Um, ready, set, go. B plot has to deal with the morality of necromancy in a fantastical world. The mage will be taking a recently dead man's face. A vain man would, of course, want a young, handsome face. <laughs> yeah. A big, I like that, though, because then there's a moral conflict, and then you can have like a little C story that's like his friend stops him from doing it or reminds him of some important moral lesson and then they turn on the necromancer or the necromancer decides to kill them and eat their faces or whatever and then they have to team up and beat him that'd be cool a big part of act one will be him trying to beat the bully and when he finally does it uh, acts as the catalyst for the rest of the story good and then we have it kind of broadening uh, and i like that because then we have a good little resolution we see him overcome something but then realize that there's so much more to overcome I'm convinced that early conflict introduction is half the reason the Da Vinci Code is so successful. I think so. I think the Da Vinci Code is very well written in the micro. That's why a big reason why it's successful. We can look at it in the future. Geekdom says amazing stream so far. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, Hardwick, my setting is Monday, 19th century. The characters go on a mundane journey and are besieged by a fantastical, initially seductive threat. It's sort of a siege story. Any advice? That's far out man I can't give a ton of advice I don't know yeah I don't know I would probably say get get to the seductive part as early as possible whatever's the most interesting thing you want to get that you want to get that early dune gurney gurney's good yes thank you Bob if or um Duncan a lot of those kind of act as mentor characters and, and friend characters that are really good but yeah, Gurney's who I'm thinking of. Can I make the love interest the mentor? Her teaching him to control his magic? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's there's like kind of a forbidden love element there. She kind of loves her student and he kind of loves her. Um, yeah, I think that would be good. 
there's like if there's a little bit of a forbidden element to it like teacher and student like at, being a teacher it's creepy and i've it's kind of funny because i was playing uh the new fire emblem game and like in the first however long in the game you're a professor to these students you're like talking up your your hot female students and like you could marry them i guess um I was a college professor and I remember that this was like, that was like a, a thing, you know, it's like I was 23 and my students were 21. It's like, if they weren't my students, I could have dated them, but I had a, I had a, I had a ethical desire to avoid such things because of the power difference between us. I never, I never flirted or talked to my students or ever dated a student. Um, but it's a little weird to see it in, in the game. It's like, not really appropriate. <laughs> know what I mean? Let's see here. And certainly if as a high school student or as a high school teacher, that's that's just creepy. Um, but people get kind of turned on or titillated by those sorts of forbidden things. If you make the characters, you know, adults and not children, uh, which is just creepy. Um, let's see here. Uh, minor conflict leading into major conflict is a good idea. It can, as long as the minor conflict is interesting. So what you want is that that transition into the Act 2, the Chaos Act, to be something that's really big, uh, at, if you're going to do it that way. Uh, stream is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, I also think that, and yes, break the rule. So any rule that's here, break it. You can break it if you feel like the story does it. That's what makes different stories interesting. If you're totally painting by numbers, it's just going to be boring and predictable. You want to do something. It's like, man, I want to do it this way, this, but this. Do it. Do it different. That's what's great. This is just like the baseline stuff. Uh, every, every great version of this has variations too. I've heard some authors on YouTube say that there are stories that aren't for people to write. Like, a white man shouldn't write about a female black slave. Where do you fall on this? I wrote a story about Japanese people and demon swords. So where do you think I fall on it? I fall in the, I fall in the area that there's nothing forbidden. Um, I'm not into PC stuff. I think if you're going to say there's stories that you shouldn't write... I think a Lolita would be a story that you shouldn't write. I don't think you should write stories that are like like promote vice or like titillate people in a way that's really disgusting. At least I wouldn't write them. You know, and I'm a very big free speech guy, but don't don't go writing like pedophile rape fantasies or something. I, I don't think that that's a good thing to write. I think uh, I think that that's something that you deserve pushback on if you're writing something like that or in yeah incest so what do you think of the whole funimation fiasco incest i don't know what the funimation fiasco is unless you're not talking to me <laughs> I, I i if you're thinking of like vic i just haven't kept up on it i don't know all the details uh like the kick vic thing i just haven't kept up on it um uh, What's your opinion on writing in non-linear form? Writing scenes as they come to mind. If So I've known several people that do that, Sammy, and it works great for them. I think it works great in screenplays. Um, for some people, I think it can be really helpful if you're, you know, I write everything linearly, but my way is not the highway. You know, it's not, I mean, it's not my way or the highway. You can do it whatever way works for you. So if you have in mind a couple of critical scenes, uh, then write those critical scenes and then write the things that go around them. There's no rule that says you can't do that. And a lot of writers do it and they do great with it. Uh, and, and if you do it that way, then you're really, you could focus on anything that's not those critical scenes, supporting and setting up those critical scenes um, or transitioning away from them in a way that's very appropriate. Uh, it, it makes it, it can make it more efficient in total if you do that. The only thing is that to me, I think I write better characters if I go linearly. That's me. Because then I'm I'm writing their dialogue as it happens. I feel like it's a natural growth with them. Um, if I'm writing things out of order, it doesn't feel as natural. Uh, of course, during the revision phase, I do things out of order anyway. So, have you read the Worm uh, Orboros? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? I actually haven't read it. Um, ethical desire, not a legal desire. A few years ago, a Journal of Higher Ed published an article from a female professor arguing she should be able to seduce her young male students. She got a ton of shit at her university afterwards. 
So I think it's an ethical thing, not legal, because my students are adults, right? They can engage in whatever relationships they want to. I'm an adult, and it's not even like there would be a creepy age difference. Um, I taught... I taught at the university for like five years or something. So at my oldest, I was like 28, 27, I think. And then um, my students would be possibly older than me. So there wasn't enough of an age difference that people would even go, that's creepy. It's like 23-year-old dude dating a 21-year-old girl or even a 19-year-old. That's still not that weird. But what's weird is that I'd be her teacher and I automatically have a position of power, right? Like I can give her a bad grade if she upsets me in our relationship. That's that's not okay to me. That's very unethical. So yeah, people shouldn't be locked up for it, but I think professors shouldn't do it. And I think I think maybe there's a code of ethics that should be followed that if you, you can't have a relationship with a current student, you could have a relationship with a student who's at the university and you're also teaching there as long as you're, you never have authority over her. But there's always a power imbalance with something like that. And it just makes it wrong. I've known several professors that married students, by the way, like three or four who married their students. They had them as a student. And then at one point they married them. But they weren't teacher student when they got married and they weren't teacher student when they started dating. Like that stuff happened after the academic relationship was gone. It always feels a little bit creepy. I would never do it because that just, it's, I would never want someone to be in a, an inferior power relationship with me in a, in a relationship. You know, you wanted them to be on equal footing. Like every, both people are, can leave or join as they want. Mr. Hankins, I have three worlds based on super ego, ego, and id. Super ego is colonial America setting in a pseudo communist world at peace with economic free zones like China. Wild. That's weird. The ego is our world in the Lovecraft mythos. What's your opinion on flash forwards to introduce the conflict early in mid year rest and going back to the beginning? It works. Um, Stephanie Meyer did it in Twilight. It works. It works well. It's, if you want to have a slow burning story, I think it's a, a good idea for a modern story that you want to be a little bit more slow burning. Give them an in media rest that just doesn't have enough information and they have to read to get it. It's a it's a cheap hook, but it works really well, so don't be afraid to use it. If it works, don't worry about someone calling it cheap. Uh, is a Wild West Victorian world that has no sun but bioluminescent life and glowing clouds and civilization pushing into a, a frontier full of mutant monsters? Oh, it is a Wild West. Okay. Yeah, I have a setting that's kind of similar to that. There's no sun. I actually have two, two sunless settings. And those books will be coming out at some point. I think it's a great, a lot of exploration that can be done there. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fear. Because we're afraid of the dark. Don't promote incest. Meanwhile, G.R.R. Martin writes a whole race of Norm, Norman elf dragon people who practice ritual pharaonic incest. And they're the protagonists breaking the rules. <laughs> people are titillated by things that are disgusting. They'll say it's disgusting and then they'll they'll get horny looking at incest porn humanity humanity's fallen and corrupt guys <laughs> uh depends what you want to do speaking of vic Mignon, i don't even know how to, Min, mignona mignona i don't know how to pronounce this geez i'm a bad guy have you heard of his fan film series star trek continues absolutely it's great um star trek continues is awesome um it is way better than the jj abrams movies i like it a lot um it is way more true to Trek in general as well. I understand that Lolita goes into very controversial territory, but what are your thoughts on the book as a book? I think it's boring, actually. If you're not titillated by it, and I'm not, I just find it gross. It gets very boring to me. Um, and then I've revealed, yeah, David's really, you know, everyone tells you to read these classics and then you read them and you're like, I think this was a classic because people who decided what classics were are like gross people i don't know why it's not a very interesting book to me outside of what's there and it, it's slightly more interesting when you understand that lolita is not she's just like a rape victim you know it's just sad that way uh, i wasn't thinking of making her a teacher she's a magical fae princess well then she takes on the role of teacher and then she, of course she can't marry him because she's a magical fae princess it's forbidden but they like each other anyway Boom, people are going to be so into that, dude. 
so into that and be like, oh, I want them to get together even though the Fae King is going to rip his heart out and use it to build a new Fae tree or whatever it's going to be. G.R. Martin does a cheap early conflict that's totally unrelated to his larger political story with the White Walkers killing two random unimportant dudes at the beginning. He has no real larger political story, in my opinion. It's soap opera. It just wanders around. So there's no larger goal. Um, it's just things reacting to each other. It's kind of like breaking, you know, you, you set up the triangle with, with pool and you break, you break it and the balls go everywhere. And they bounce into each other and then you play pool so i think he's playing a game of pool in terms of story not plotting things out and he said so he's not a plotter and that's why i think the ending is going to be impossible to pull off it's really hard to pull off plot, uh, endings if you're not a plotter uh people get thrilled by the taboo that's true they've always gotten thrilled by the taboo though do you have any recommendations on writing stories with vampires as the main protagonist um you can go two routes. You can go, uh, you can go Rice, or you could go Meyer. So Stephanie Meyer goes with like sparkle, sweet vampires, and Rice goes with vampires are essentially corrupted by their nature, regardless of what they desire to do, and everything's a stand-in for like homoerotic sex. I like I like Rice a little better, personally, personally. Soap opera by people with political power. That's a good one. I agree. All right, let's talk about Act 2 and Act 3. Act 2 is chaos. So after you have this big event happen and everybody ends up on the on the defensive, the protagonist has to act, I call Act 2 chaos because you can do anything with this act. This is where you really get to do things that are unexpected, creative. You get to take, take the story in new, interesting directions. Um, it's where the plot events really gain importance. They're either moving you closer to the plot goal, the overall plot goal of the conflict, the resolution of the conflict, or moving you away from it, or ratcheting up the tension, making sure that there's a huge amount of uncertainty as to whether you're going to accomplish it. So the protagonist is searching for something to resolve the conflict. They're, everybody's trying to find a solution to the conflict. And then by the end of, the, of, of Act 2, the Chaos Act, they're formulating a plan for how they're going to actually um, accomplish it. The B story is primarily occupied in the chaos setting. If you like the girl, does the girl like you? Does she not like you? How are you going to get her to like you? Um, I have to do this, but the girl doesn't want me to. I have to fight the bad guy, but the girl says no. Uh, I have a big karate competition coming up with the antagonist, and I'm training hard to beat him, but my girlfriend says I shouldn't fight him, and she's upset that I'm fighting him. But I know that if I don't fight him, I'll lose her respect. You know, that's all Act 2 chaos stuff with the B story. Then you can have basically a beginning of a C story. So the C story usually involves a tertiary character's growth into a full member of the plot. So you have the best friend who is uh, struggling with something and then grows. So in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you have the best friend who they've been taking his dad's Ferrari around and... Um, the C story that really kind of sets up the whole the whole thing is his relationship with his dad. He's got this terrible relationship with his dad and he can't fix the miles on his Ferrari. He ends up accidentally knocking the Ferrari out the window and destroying it. And then that just causes him to go, all this is out of my control. My dad's going to have to deal with this now. And I'm I have achieved growth on accident, you know. So that's a really good example of a C story moving things into the end. Um, he gets convinced to, you know, he's being slowly convinced to be more rebellious of his father. And finally, in the uh, final act with Ferris Bueller, he becomes more like Ferris. He becomes a full actor in the plot. He becomes capable of doing his own things. So the transition to the third act usually involves a failure of the protagonist to to enact his plans. Um, so maybe he fights a battle with the bad guy, but he loses due to his fatal flaw. So this is where the fatal flaw comes into play. So if your fatal flaw is, say, pride, then you're going to have a duel with the antagonist. And the antagonist, he knows how good he is, 
but you think that you're better than him and or the protagonist thinks he's better than him and the protagonist gets his butt kicked or he gets stabbed in the duel and almost dies and gets saved at the last minute and has to has to figure out how he's actually going to beat the antagonist um this is a really like this is a really typical thing that you do and the thing here is that you are going to get close to to this what you think might be a plot resolution and then you're going to go away from it and you're going to crank up the tension and create a huge amount of uncertainty and doubt as to whether you're actually going to accomplish the plot goals and from there act three is about the great contest okay so the great contest aka the final battle this is where the protagonist finally is having to either resolve the conflict or fail to resolve the conflict usually what happens at the beginning of this part of the transition is there's a big setback a lot of times there's a moment uh, that in screenwriting is called the dark night of the soul the dark night of the soul is where the protagonist has to reflect on his actions himself his nature his expectations his flaws and correct something in order to try to achieve victory and so that moment is part of prolonging the tension of the story and making it uncertain then having experienced that moment and grown from it gained some kind of special insight he's able to you know to face the the last boss if you will he's able to fight the antagonist and um and able to actually accomplish what he hopes is the is the correct plot goals um now this can I, i'm describing this in kind of epic terms but you could have this in a in a romance novel right with a with a love triangle is that the protagonist um loses to the antagonist in some way the girl goes with him instead of instead of the protagonist goes with the, the antagonist and the protagonist has to figure out how he went wrong and then he has to overcome you know he has to convince the the girl to get back with him or something like that there's a bunch of different ways that this can this can be iterated star wars it's it's really kind of kind of classic there's always a final battle at star wars it's really easy to think of that um, most fantasy and sci-fi novels, you have a literal battle that happens at the end of the book, either a duel or uh, some sort of significant and and epic event to draw everything to a close. And be, the the virtue of having a final contest in Karate Kid, of course, he has to fight a final match. You know, in Bloodsport, he has to fight the last fight. You know, uh, all of these movies and books, they all use the same same kind of thing. I know I refer to movies a lot when I'm talking about books, but tends to be people have seen more seen the movies more than the books um so there's usually going to be some kind of big conflict that ties everything off at the end um so if i read this typically part of the story involves a loss due to a fatal flaw a dark night of the soul where the protagonist must reflect on his flaws and reformulate his understanding of the situation in a final battle where outcomes are uncertain now how the c story works is uh, and i could probably put this as a note the c story tends to help the a story resolve so the protagonist is not strong enough to overcome the antagonist and in fact he will lose but the best friend helps the protagonist through his own growth he comes to be a full member of the plot and helps the protagonist to overcome his um his final obstacles and win the plot and the protagonist doesn't have to win i'll put that as a note um, so I used Empire Strikes Back as another example because everyone's seen it. You know, Act One, the rebellion is exp is in hiding. So you see that they're on an ice planet, a very not a fun place to live. It means they're really in desperate situation. Even though they've blown up the Death Star, they're still on the run. Luke is given his motivations for seeking Yoda in the first act. So there's the first A story, the first big plot goal. Rather than thinking of it as a conflict, there's no conflict with Yoda. The conflict is I have to defeat the Empire. But the plot goal is I have to go to Yoda to get stronger. Um, and he does that after he's attacked by the Yeti or the, you know, the ice monster thing. Then you have a sudden attack by the Empire led by Vader, the antagonist, um, 
or actually he's actually the protagonist because he's the one doing all the planning but that attack is the transition into act two it puts everybody on their guard they have to flee the ice planet they have to go their separate ways they're now on the defensive in the chaos act Act two is the Chaos Act. Luke learns how far he has yet to go to defeat uh, Vader. The reality of Yoda is revealed to him. His uh, his self is revealed to him when he fights, you know, the illusion of Vader inside the the cave. Um, and then there's a B story. Han and Leia have a romance. Uh, then you have a transition where Han and Leia are captured at Cloud City. Um, this is a failure, basically. Um, they haven't been able. They're not able to escape. And so. As a result of that, the sea story is really Vader's sea story, where he captures Leia and lures Luke. So Luke reacts to that to go to the final battle. He's not prepared. Um, there's no one to save him because his his uh, sea story pal Han Solo has been frozen in carbonite. So because the sea story has been negated, he doesn't have his friend to save him like in the first film. He loses to, to Vader and has a terrible revelation, revelation, which is that Darth Vader is actually his father. So he suffers total defeat. If you look at the first movie, uh, the sea story is Han Solo, who's a, a maverick, a bad boy, learning to care about something beyond himself. That matriculates when he saves Luke from Darth Vader in the Death Star attack. In this one, it's, it's kind of an inversion of that. Because Han is frozen in carbonite, he can't save Luke. And so Luke is defeated. So the fact that there's no C story with his best bro basically means that he loses. It's a, it's a great way to think about this. All right, let's take a look at some of the chat before we get going here. It's almost time to go. Let's see here. What are your thoughts on learning by osmosis? I got most of my writing style by learning by osmosis from 19th century writers, especially Poe. That's how... So, I think the best learning is by reading and experiencing, and uh, I think it's important to analyze as well, to think about why something does something, right? Uh, osmosis would be you just read a lot and then you magically imitate. You imitate. That happens. I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen to me on some level, but I tend to think a little bit more consciously about the things that I really like, and that helps me. So I think it's a great way to learn, to just do lots of reading, and you're going to pick up a lot of what the stylistic elements there are, and you can easily replicate them because you've seen them so many times. So it's a lot easier to replicate a style that you've just seen and been immersed in and experienced versus trying to do it from some theoretical or technical space. It never quite works out. Once you're kind of in the world of a particular style, then it's really easy to replicate it. So if you read lots of, of uh, Lovecraft, then it's not going to be too hard to replicate Lovecraft because his style is just a voice. There's a voice that you're able to kind of channel and imitate um, without having to think about it. Just like how you channel and imitate your parents' voice when you learn to speak. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, what do you think about the Redwall books by Brian Shock? I haven't read them since I was a kid, but I really liked them. Um, I thought they were great stories. <laughs> um, in Final Fantasy VII, Act Three starts when Cloud regains his mind and resolves to destroy Sephiroth before the meteor destroys the world. Yeah. Um, if you apply the hero's journey to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Ferris is the mentor and his friend is the hero. Yeah, Ferris has no growth arc, but the best friend does, and Ferris guides him. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, could I get a t copy? Yes, it will, I'll send it out to the mailing list after I'm done here, and you can you can use this however you want. I'll, I might turn this into a book at some point that's a lot more fleshed out than this, um, but I, I mostly like this because then I can just see questions and answers and just answer. Them, you know, it's more like a more like a lecture setting, more like a seminar setting, and less like you know read this book and hopefully you get the information because I might not be clear about something. Do you like the type of eye-poppingly colorful babes and bug-eyed monsters pulp sci-fi cover paintings common in the 1930s to 1950s? I love them. Yeah, I love them. I, I think it's a pity we got away from them. Um, I think science fiction was kind of taken over by fuddy-duddies and busybodies and boring people that wanted sci-fi to be a boring intellectual exercise or to express some social complaints rather than it being a great genre on its own real sci-fi i shouldn't say real sci-fi um 
classic sci-fi was just as much about character drama as it was about ideas. And it was about big, grand, and fun things rather than just about, here's a social idea of like Stranger in a Strange Land, which is a good book, um, is mostly about this idea that all of our ways that we arrange our lives are artificial and so they're social constructs. Um, which is interesting, but it's not as compelling or fun. It's not fun in the way that like a Buck Rogers story would be or something like that, you know? So yeah, I'm a big fan of those. I like old pulps and that's kind of what I'm pulling from for this course is I want, I want to think like pulp writers, write quickly, write efficiently and, uh, write according to good story practices and out will pop a good story that you have enjoyed writing and, uh, that you, people will like to read they'll have a connection with. How does the mailing list work exactly? dvspress.com slash list. You don't want to be on the freebie list. I'm getting rid of that list. Um, it's just still up on there. So um, get on the mailing list. Uh, it will, this is just occasionally I send out emails of like, I put out a book. Here's a video I did that I think people should watch. I send out like one a month, maybe, right? I very infrequently send out emails because I don't want people to get annoyed by having emails in their mailbox. So maybe I should send out more. Um, the conventional wisdom for writers is you want to be sending out emails all the time. But for me, YouTube is the main thing. YouTube's the main thing. So uh, yeah, dvspress.com slash list. And what's your thoughts on Moon is Jahar's Mistress? I liked it. I liked it a lot and I liked the ideas in it. I thought it was a, I thought it was a really good book, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. I like um, I like Heinlein quite a bit. So I was critical of Starship Troopers because I actually think it's one of his, in terms of the way it's constructed, it's one of his worst books. It has ideas that have really persisted in the public consciousness. Oddly, not the ideas that he wanted. So the ideas that tend to persist are um, are things like power armor and the the deeper stuff is stuff like, oh, you know, service guarantee citizenship. It's very popular in military circles. And so people get extremely upset when I, basically when I say that it's not a very well-written book, but there's not much story there. The plot, it's not very good. So hit this, you wanna hit main list. It'll take you to this page right here. In fact, I could just put that in right here. Um, this, this way I can email, I'll email it after this and talk about what we're doing. Um, you, generally, if you're on the mailing list, I send out free books too, so you can read those. So you'll get a free book, and that's that. This is an easy way for me to distribute it. I might also put it on the website. So if you follow me on Twitter, I'll probably have a page that'll have a, you know, a little FTB download link or something for you to look at the document and edit it. Um, <sighs> Streams really helped. I think I know where I'm going with this book now. I'm glad. I, I want you to have fun with it and build. I want people to write the books that they want to write and enjoy it. Uh, Film Girl, I was thinking of having my characters be in a choice based arranged marriage. A little twist I added, but uh, then through work, they're forced to deal with each other while trying to deal. Hmm, interesting. I. <laughs> I think arranged marriage is a very interesting thing. In my fantasy world, most marriages are arranged because that's what's traditional. And people have to deal with, you know, love. How does love fit into that? Can you love someone that you've arranged in a marriage with? I'm on the fence between writing overt, a relatively overt allegory and suppressing, camouflaging the allegorical elements. The context is related to modern politics. What are your thoughts? If the context is modern politics, in time, the allegory tends to get lost or muddled. Um, kind of like Tolkien, I'm not a fan of really heavy allegory because it you should write your own story. But it's up to you. You know, If you want to write allegory, allegory is what you want to do. If the point of the book is to have the allegorical message, you should be overt with it, in my opinion, so people can understand what's there versus suppressing it and making it uncertain, you know, I think it's probably just slightly better to be kind of upfront with what you're doing. That's just me. If the, if the purpose is the allegorical message, if, if the allegorical message is just there 
I would probably cut it. You know, if it's not, if it doesn't, if you don't really care that much about the allegorical message, I'd suppress it. But if you care about it, I'd have it pretty upfront. The A story is the BPD character's growth and confrontation of self fear. So the self is is the self fear some? It's got to be some kind of overarching thing that's impossible to to overcome. The B story is a prodigal, a prodigal alchemist developing schizophrenia, unleashing a supernatural entity called the Pale Mother into a city, which wreaks havoc, making babies sick. That sounds more like an A story to me, right? Because you got to kill this dude. You got to versus overcoming fear. This is like a B story. Overcoming a personal flaw is a B story, not an A story for the most part. The A story is something that is firm that's got to happen. So I would probably have all my emphasis on this supernatural entity and have the A story be the main character have to kill it in order to protect people. Government freaks out and cracks down. The mentor investigates the source and finds a warped skull. The government is able to capture and subdue the entity. Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, you're you're turning the mentor into like the, the the that's a good twist. It's a good twist, but I'd probably change the emphasis. Because you want that clear and present danger to to kind of suck people in. If you're not leading with that, if it's just like this person's afraid and has to overcome his fear, that's not like a tangible goal that you're uncertain of whether you're going to overcome. It's something that you overcome in order to accomplish a goal. Uh, that's how I would do it anyway. You can do whatever you want though. You can break the rules. Uh, I may adapt this book as a script later on. The ideas I have and uh, what I want to execute seems like it would translate well on a big screen. Yeah, you can always, uh, adapting a script is not that hard because you can reuse a lot of the dialogue and then you just turn the prose into simplified directions. What's your advice on writing robots that are like humans? How hard would it be if a character is a teenager? I've never done that, so I don't know. I don't think I have advice. I would look at what other people have done. You know, there's like, I don't know, Ex Machina, that's not quite right, but you know, Blade Runner, uh, that kind of stuff is probably what I'd wanna be looking at for to figure that out. Can A story and B story swap importance? They can. But it, it has to do with what you're going to emphasize is what people are going to, you know, that's what they're going to focus on. So the B story can be can be a big part of it, overcoming personal challenges. And if we pull another fantasy book out of out of my thoughts, um, the first Mistborn book, the A story is we have to get rid of the Lord Ruler somehow. Most of the book is not spent actually figuring out how to kill the Lord Ruler, but having uh, the main character, who, the girl, I don't remember her name, uh, have her personal growth overcome. So the, there's a strong emphasis in the second act on her overcoming her personal problems and becoming a full featured and fully powerful protagonist. Um, and then the C story ends up being um, centered around the magic system. You know, what does this metal do? What is this, what's this 11th metal and is there a 12th metal? What does it actually do? Um, and what's the truth about the the Lord Ruler? You know, it's a weird sea story. It kind of centers around the, you know, the there's a mentor character who's almost a protagonist, but definitely becomes a mentor towards the end. I wanted to take the arranged marriage idea and change it slightly, but I don't know if it works better as the A story or the B story, where the villain fits in. So. An arranged marriage sounds more B story to me. But it could be the A story. It depends on what kind of book or what kind of story you're writing. You know, something that's a romance or something that's a little more down to earth, it could be an A story. Um, but it, it tends to be, you know, you can have an A story take less space and have it be like someone's in debt and has to get out of debt. You know, that's a pretty down to earth story. They're going to repossess the farm. Have you seen Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow? I I have so little memory of it, I don't think I saw it. Now that sounds weird, right? But it came out forever ago and I remember previews of it and I think I watched part of it, but I don't really remember it. 
you know. So I, that makes me think I have probably watched like ten minutes of it in my mom's house and then did something else. So I'll, I don't have any thoughts on it. Uh, so that makes me think I didn't watch it, at least in total, or I probably remember it in detail. Um, I remember it was shot in like a weird filter though, a weird soft filter. Okay. All right, we are out of time. It's 7.57, so that means um, it's about time to call it for tonight. Hopefully, you um, you have an idea of what to do here. Um, your main thing with your plotting is uh, you're going to do these three things. Now, I want to finish up by just suggesting that you can actually go scene by scene. Um, and so I might do one that's going scene by scene, and if I do, I'll, I'll hit you here. So... Uh, I have an act one, but you know I could do this like uh, you know scene one, and uh, you know it's uh, Jacobus uh, kills a demon, and then executes the man who called on him because he did not immediately confess his sin in summoning the demon in the world. Um, so he judges him like an evil apostate and kills him. So that's the first scene. You know, scene two, instead of I, let's do one. You know, scene two, and, you know, Jacobus, Jacobus, gets a mission on his ship, etc., etc. And you can go scene by scene and build it out that way. Just a brief description of what you want to happen, and you can even break it down. So act one, you know, this is gonna be act one. And then act two would be, you know, um, you have seen whatever, and then act three, uh, I would do the important events for that. You know, turns out this guy's like this, and in this scene he does this, and then you finally have it all, all plotted out. If you want, I can share you like a scene by scene of what I did. A lot of people do this. This is basically what I do. But I don't write scene one, scene two. I just write events. And sometimes I split them into two scenes to explain what's happening. Sometimes it's several ones mel melted into one scene. It's just the events that make up the, the entire, all three acts of the plot. And then I write it. And that's what I do. Okay? So hopefully that helps you guys out. Um, thank you for joining me. And I hope that... Uh, I hope that you will have success with this. Um, for Mateus, you know, you're plotting now thanks to me and Blandis, Brandis Anderson. Hopefully that's useful, and I hope you are able to complete that and make it the story that you want to make it. Um, let's see here. I think that's about it. Um, it's pronounced Jacobus. It's pronounced Jacobus. It's Dutch. I almost named my son that, but, but my wife and I were like, we love Jacobus. But everyone's just going to call him Jacob. So we're not going to name him Jacobus. We named him Rome. <laughs> so anyway, guys, thanks so much. And uh, I will see you guys next time. Let's see here. Where am I? Oh, yeah. Let me do some plugs. So get on the mailing list, dvspress.com slash list. And uh, if you, you'll get a free book. I think right now you get, you're going to get Voice of the Void, which is my new book. People really like this one. So experiments, This I'm gonna do another experimental book. Experimental books are cool because sometimes they really blow up. People are really liking Voices of the Void. This is what I call Aliens meets Lovecraft. And so uh, I'm gonna do another book of similar length, 20 to 30,000 words, like some of these other mini books that I've done uh, as of late. And uh, then we will have that out, another experimental one. You will also get Water of Awakening wherever, I don't know where my copy is. I was going to look at another book for this, which was, I was going to look at Spider-Man, the very first Spider-Man comic, um, which actually has this three-act structure, but we'll do that in a separate video, okay? So stay tuned for later in the week, and I'll explain um, the first Spider-Man comic, how it kind of fits this this whole approach that we're talking about super condensed writing stanley was very good at distilling all this stuff down into like 10 10 or 20 page comments uh comics you know did a great job um noctis says you have to let us hear the hear the hello Kitty guitar through the mesa we could do that sometime i think i've done it before but it just sounds like metallica it's a really good metal guitar it's really good for playing death metal 
there's no tone pot, so it's really wide open and bright. Sounds great. Is a final act with only the protagonist and the monsters trying to kill him a workable idea? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. It's alone in the dark. It's the most frightening way to do it. Yeah. So you could have everybody fall off and it's just the it's just the main guy and the monsters at the end and that's really scary. Um, it's like the final part of the first berserk arc. It's just guts against the demons. <laughs> you know, that's how it has to end. Yeah. So anyway, so hop on the list, you get the ebook for that for free. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Have a great one.